and welcome and thank you so much for joining us on this spits and suds post game edition unfortunately what looked like a victory and two points edition of spits and suds actually is a tough loss for the dallas stars as they were up three to nothing and end up losing the game four to three in a really exciting game at the double ac i'm gavin spittle of 105.3 the fan and we are truly happy to be joined by our friend of spits and suds and you can reach him at david castillo and his sub stack is at stars stack and you can also read him in d magazine and david how are you my friend well we talked about this right it was difficult days for yes. everyone including us and yes. the stars just compounded everything <laughs> um, which is I, I, it can either like be comforting to know that like well you know misery is not just for uh plebes like myself but um yeah i mean i would say i'm doing better now because when you say truly happy i believe it gavin yeah <laughs> well i think you know i really appreciate joe pavelski's veteran leadership he took the microphone after the game and one of the things that he said was i think this happened at the right time and I think if other people say it, it might not have as much effect. Um, but, you know, he went into further detail talking about we just have to win every single period as we head toward the playoffs, you know, two to one, whether it's three to nothing. I thought that it was a good thing to say. It was a leadership thing to say. Pete DeBoer was told about it after the game and agreed and we go back to two games and, you know, throughout every season, you can look at losses and say, maybe that's the one, but up three to nothing against Colorado up three to nothing against Florida. Um, those are a uh, tough four points to lose when you're battling for a central division lead. I, that's a great uh, quote and really just a great moment from Pavelski. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's fitting that you kind of mentioned him because I, I think, so I'm someone that, that, Yes, I do buy quote unquote analytics and I do love the sort of deeper cuts of information. And if you look at a lot of those higher level analytics, right, they all say that Pavelski is having just like the worst season of his career in terms of shift to shift impact. Now, has he been productive? Yes. Um, but to me, I think what the, the analogy that I made on uh, the, the other day was the idea, and this is why I always like to use price fighting as an analogy to hockey instead of stuff like soccer or basketball, because yes, sure, they're more like there, there's a systems element within all those team sports versus an individual sport, like say boxing. But what is it they, they always say the last thing in a fighter goes? Their power, right? They may lose rounds, they may lose their defense, their reaction time, all that stuff, but they don't lose power. And just look at George Foreman versus Michael Moore for proof, right? Mm. Uh, of course, there are plenty of other examples. But when I when I think about that Pavelski's quote, and I think about like him scoring a goal, and he had what like two the other night, um, that's kind of what I think about. Which is that when I'm you know showing people like you know what some of these histograms and fancy stats uh, show me, it's not like hey, this is a bad chart, therefore this is a bad player. No, this is like a player that has struggled to maybe play on the level that he's used to, but that doesn't say anything about how dangerous he still is. Just like, you know, the puncher that still has that power. And, and to me, that's not just a uh, sort of like a literal, um, like, a, you know, a literal comparison because he's still a really good shooter, but also I, I think kind of works in the abstract too, where, you know, a guy like that making that comment really sort of harnesses, I think, um, team chemistry, cohesion, optimism. And so, yeah, no matter what I say about like, you know, these awful histograms that Pavelski is attached to, listen, the guy is still dangerous and that's all he needs to be. And if you add elite like leadership to that, all the better. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, lots to talk about tonight. Um, stars, I thought played really, really well. I thought they did an amazing zone job with their zone outlets, David. I thought that, you know, um, they had Florida on their heels. They were preventing Florida for any kind of sustainable momentum. Um, they used some physicality at times. Um, you know, I think they outplayed Florida. 
Um, but, you know, Pete DeBoer mentioned uh, after the game, and it's pretty apparent, you cannot commit two penalties within the last 10 minutes of a game against the number one team in the NHL. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to talk about the Mason Marchment penalty because I did feel as though it was roughing. I feel as though these guys are good enough skaters to hold up. And I just think when you're up three to nothing, you shouldn't commit penalties like that. And it led to the first goal uh, by Florida. And I think that was a big one. I think the uh, Jason Robertson holding was also big because I felt as though that was behind the play. Uh, Penalties are going to happen throughout the game. I just think that at times you, uh, while playing hard, you have to realize the score and, uh, you know, not allow that team any kind of momentum prior to the Marchman penalty. I just didn't think Florida really had a lot of momentum, David. I would. So I've always been uh, more of a determinist. (laughs) And so (laughs) my my thing with that is that, well, if you didn't get that Marchman penalty, well, then you wouldn't get the player that, you know, right. The guy that's physical um, that sort of plays with that edge and that doesn't negate what you said. Like, absolutely. It was still, you know, I, I think when you have two really fantastic teams, which is let's not get lost in, in sort of Dallas losing, like Florida yeah. is the top team in the entire NHL, yes. right? There's absolutely no shame in losing for three. Now the shame comes with the period, but when you lose games to great teams, they tend to be in moments. And that was absolutely a moment that Dallas lost with Marchman taking a penalty. I think my, my thing ultimately is just that, well, you accept that Marchman is going to take penalties because of the other things that he does that I think informs the way he plays, the physicality, the chippiness, which is not something that, and I'm not trying to gas up Marchman. It's just, it's not something that Dallas really has otherwise, right? They don't have like a real physical pest type player. Ben is not that anymore. Like he, honestly, like I don't really think of Ben as ever being that. I, I always thought of, you know, Right, the dainty barbarian. That was what Razor called him. And I always thought that was fitting because I always felt like Ben played more of a small man's game. And so um, did it change the dynamic? Thing? Yes. I, I would say that what changed the dynamic even more and perhaps is more concerning than, say, Marchman's penalty is, for example, Hawk and Pop. Hawk and Paw's play on the PK. Yeah. Um, also the – and not just his PK, but also when Robertson took that penalty, it happened because – Hawk and Paw just lost a corner battle and made really weird decisions like on his gaps. And um, I, I think that's another thing that that sort of is probably going to become more prevalent. I mean, and I'm interested in kind of what you think, which is, well, I know it's not going to happen. So I don't want to like get this, um, get this misconstrued <laughs> um, for, for reasons that, uh, well, you know what, listen, I don't want this. I don't want this to get misconstrued, but Lundqvist is not going to draw back in. However, do you think games like that force you personally? Right, we know we know Hockenpah is going to stay in. Yeah, but you personally, would you prefer to see Lundqvist on a pairing with Sutter, based on games like tonight? Yes. Now that now that Tanif is part of the top six, yes, I I I would. In fact, this brings David back into the mix because on Friday's podcast of spits and suds, <laughs> I brought up Liam Bixel being inserted into the lineup at some point, maybe that yes. chance. And the response was you've been hanging out with David Castillo too long. <laughs> uh, I, I thought that was so great. And by the way, uh, which why I, I talked about this uh, on my sub stack and kind of addressed Sean, Sean, by the way, uh, freaking, we love you. I love you. Your coverage yes. is like essential. And um, yeah, especially at a time like a time like now when, you know, hockey coverage is dwindling and, you know, you know, TV show, you know, TV is going bankrupt, yada, yada, yada. Right. Uh, So you're the best. Uh, What I would say, though, is that, you know, and it's something that I wrote about, which is that Big Cell is not going to play in the playoffs. And I'm not under any delusion that he will. What I would say, though, is that I think a lot of that delusion is informed by the way the the way prospects are typically treated which is this negative foundation of well he's young therefore he's going to be ineffective or he's young and talented but there's never like well he's young talented how can we leverage that to the best of our abilities and and so yeah sure like do i do i think that 
Big Cell is is ready to like play in the playoffs, you know, as at his age. No, not necessarily. But I also don't think I think if you're matching these players skill for skill for skill and kind of just judging them purely in kind of scouting terminology, Big Cell is not a player that I think would have trouble. I personally think he is NHL ready. NHL ready and playoff ready is maybe two different things. Sure. I want to make that clear. But at the same time, like I think Laura, I think so much of that, and, and I'm not necessarily talking about Sean, but I think so much of how we view prospects is through that classic lens of, well, we don't know enough about them and therefore we can't take a chance to potentially challenge them yeah. as if challenging them is going to destroy them. And I don't think that's the case. And, um, I think Big Cell is a little bit different because we're talking about a much younger player, you know, with a much more difficult position. Um, but, you know, these players need to be challenged. They want and it. I think in a lot of cases they want to be challenged. And so that that sort of that definition of NHL readiness is is, I think, a really unique gray area that doesn't get discussed enough. You know, like you look at Stankoven. All right, was was Stankoven NHL ready like when he started scoring for Dallas? No. Right. He was ready before then. Yeah. Like and 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 so figuring out what that readiness, where it is, where it lies, and where it can be leveraged for, you know, everyday NHL or effectiveness is I think a discussion that's rarely had because of the culture. Well, Hot. and we, we know that the organization is pretty conservative as far as their call ups. Um, you know, you know, with Ottinger starting the season down and Jason Robertson um before he came up and that is in my mind regarding Maverick Bork and this, you know, you could say, Gavin, this is a May June conversation and I understand what you're saying, but I was thinking about this the other day, um, signing, re-signing either Pavelski or Duchesne because Maverick Bork has not had any NHL experience. At some point you have to say to yourself, this is likely the AHL MVP. He's showing signs and it's okay if he doesn't make it at the NHL level, but all signs are pointing to a really, really good player at the NHL. And therefore I can say, you know what? We love you, Matt Duchesne, but we're going to make Maverick Bork the third line center. And we're going to, you know, go with that money and we're going to put money toward defense. And so those are the tough decisions. I know Jim Neal has to make, um, but you know, I, I try to tell stars fans that you, you can, you don't put Maverick Bork at a fourth line center position. I mean, it's a, it's a top three situation. So, um, you know, we're kind of going down rabbit holes, David, that, but I mean, that's, but I mean, it does, it does make sense when you look at, you know, the outstanding play of Wyatt Johnston, Logan, Logan Stankov, and kids can come up and make a massive difference from you. I thought Wyatt Johnston and, and Stankov and, um, gave and Ben gave a lot of problems to Florida tonight. Yeah, and it, by the way, I, I do want because you already sent us down that rabbit hole. I do want to yeah, like oh, oh. Uh, plug the uh, a really great uh, analysis uh, from the PDO podcast with Dmitry Filipovich and Daryl Belfry, who the forty eight minutes dedicated to nothing but like Logan Stankoven, um, and and um, and it's. When you listen to a lot of their descriptions, of course, there's a lot of kind of like hockey nerd terminology. I don't want to say like really official terminology and in sort of scouting and coaching circles. But um, one of the the one of the things that um, they point out, Belfry in particular, uh, who's you know taught uh, you know taught skills to players like Austin Matthews and Patrick Kane. You know, one of the things he he pointed out was Stankoven's kind of next play mentality. And the way he's able to kind of leverage speed and puck handling along the walls, which is not typical for, you know, forwards, especially forwards that size. And the reason why I mention that is because Maverick Bork is a lot like that. Now, his game is based less on physicality and more on kind of just his reads and, and IQ, but very, very similar. And I would actually make the argument that Bork is somebody that should be playing, um, you know, unlike Bix, you know, Bork has plenty of pro experience at this point, but um, I can't help, like, I can't help but feel that in a perfect world, Bork is a part of the current roster and absolutely makes a difference. Now, contracts, veteran stuff, you know, you just sort of you just, veteran subterfuge, I should say, you're just not going to get that. But um, it's, it's going to be exciting next year to see Bork up with the big team because we know he will be. 
And that's just something you don't, and that's to Neil's credit, something you don't see in contenders. The fact that, well, yeah, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're competing for a Stanley Cup, but man, we're really looking forward to that next generation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. So those of you that listen to Spits and Suds on a regular basis know that I talk to about Jake Ottinger a lot, and I think Jake Ottinger is a very good goalie. Um, if you go through Twitter tonight and do a search of Jake Ottinger, <laughs> you'll see send Jake Ottinger to Beijing. Um, you'll see all kinds of what is he doing? Um, you know, you'll see uh, Jake Ottinger since the beginning of the 2023 playoffs has a minus 13.73 GSA X. Good thing we didn't add a goalie at the deadline. Um <laughs> You know, I mean, it's a Dallas is a good team. It's a shame they might be one Jake Ottinger away from losing in round one. Damn. So, so I know. So I defer to you, David, you know, because I'm obviously the guy with the bias. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, maybe one he might have saved. Like, I just I I don't I mean, I saw a lot of deflections tonight and, um, you know, I'm not here to. Like, say, like, did Jake Ottinger stand on his head? No, but he made some good saves. I just don't, I think that any puck that goes in the net, people blame Jake Ottinger. I, I do think there's there's a tendency to, um, uh, there's the kind of that, uh, that sort of anchoring effect, right? There's a tendency to be like, well, uh, Ottinger is responsible for, Whatever whatever goal goes in, right? Andrew is going to be the last person, kind of you know, defending that puck from going past the uh, you know into the net. But uh, I also think there's a level of like, well, that's part of their job though too, right? Part of their job is is to stop pucks, and um, those pucks are going to come from dangerous areas sometimes, and that's also part of your job, right? To stop you know the high danger chances. And um, so while I kind of disagree with you sort of fundamentally, I also agree with you in terms of, well, um, Dallas is a team that allows a lot of high danger chances. Yes, mm -hmm. they grade out well defensively, but in terms of high danger chances, yes, they do allow way too much. And, and I think that, I think that factors into, I also think just kind of the play, right? The sort of the momentum shifts also kind of factor into goalie performance. Yeah. And like you mentioned, the March penalty and just the the sudden breakdowns in the last 10 minutes of the game. Yeah. You know, that's that part you can't, you know, Hodger wasn't the one you lose in defensive assignments and and not push and play in the offensive zone. And so I don't want to make too many excuses for Andre because I, I do think broadly speaking, it's a difficult year. It's been a difficult it's, year. And it's yeah, and, and it's a year that I think you can give him plenty of blame for. But I think a game like tonight was a good example of Dallas's blue line really kind of losing these moments. Um, what hopefully, and I personally think Dallas is you know absolutely one of like the favorites to win the cup. Um, but I do think if they do lose, we'll know why. And yeah. yes. Sure, like Odinger will be part of that conversation, but it'll be the same thing. I mean, you could make an argument that like I think I think Jim Neal did great at the deadline, but you could definitely make an argument that they should have done just one of the defensemen, and that other defenseman to replace Hawk and Paw would have been perfect. That would have yeah. been the chef's kiss. That would have been ideal, the perfect world. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. When you're gearing up for good times, nobody gets you ready faster than Specs. Stock up for the season with lower prices on a texas size selection of world-class wines, hard-to-find spirits, craft beers, and gourmet foods, all under one roof. 
It's your on the way, less to pay for every day store. So, when you're getting ready for a good time, Specs is ready to make it great. Because at Specs, the fun starts here. Dive into Seafood Month at Taqueria Sarandas and Aranda Seafood this Lent. Visit any Taqueria Sarandas location for 30 times delicious shrimp at a special deal or try our shrimp cocktail, seafood soup, or seafood tacos. Don't miss out! Head to Aranda Seafood off I-10 and Mercury or Highway 249 between Bamel North Houston and Fallbrook for a taste of the sea. Make this Lent unforgettable with the freshest catches and tantalizing flavors at Taqueria Sarandas and Aranda Seafood. Check them out online at taqueriasarandas.com. Having the tough conversation and scratching somebody and, you know, putting someone better in. And I felt as though Colorado did that. Um, so, uh, but, you know, I also go back 2021, 2022. I've mentioned this on the podcast. Connor Hallibuck, 2.97 goals against for the year and a 9.10 save percentage. And he bounced back. And I completely agree with you. This is a different Jake Ottinger, whether it's the injury, I'm not sure whether it's a different load management, you know, but there definitely has been a regression this year in his play. So I raise my hand and say that I'm just saying not every goalie, not every is, you know, on a goal flip side, clearly Bobrovsky was the better goaltender tonight. I thought Bobrovsky won them the game early Um, they mentioned it on the broadcast, remember these saves and they write, um, you know, I think the stars lost it by going in the penalty box and making some mistakes as you pointed out, David, but you know, their goalie, um, who has played at an elite level, uh, since the Stanley cup playoffs last year, uh, made some amazing saves. His track record against the stars is just unreal. Um, and you know, the Florida, Florida Panthers and Paul Maurice, and it's just one of those things where, I mean, we saw that last year against the Boston Bruins. I mean, that's the telltale sign. Boston had them. They should have been eliminated. They shouldn't have been even in the playoffs and they squeaked their way in. So they're a team that just keeps chugging, even though they've traded out some players and stuff like that. Don't forget, Um, by the way, don't forget all it would have taken for Florida to miss was Pittsburgh. Yes. Chicago. Yes. That's a shot at Gregory Finley, our producer, who's in Pittsburgh. But oh, yes, I agree. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, David. That's a that's a great point. Um, if Pittsburgh had beaten Chicago, then the Florida Panthers wouldn't have been in. I thought early, I thought the Aaron Ekblad injury was, you know, was causing some major issues. I think that he is an underrated portion of that Florida Panthers team. Um, He's the guy, their quarterback, and uh, I think losing him, um, you know, certainly hurt, you know, as as Florida at times was committing some turnovers. That first goal was a a rough one that led to the uh, Pavelski uh, first goal. So, you know, it's it's one of those games that I think you can be frustrated. But at the same time, if they rebound, they're five and one in their last six. Um. You know, I mean, these things happen during the season. It doesn't mean it's good, but at the same time, you know, they're still, you know, up there in the lead. And, uh, you know, that's why I'm trying not to sound pessimistic. It's like, you know, this is disappointing, but at the same time, if it can recharge the engines in some way, David, maybe, you know, uh, get big wins on Thursday and with the Madonna statue on Saturday, another big win (laughs) against the LA Kings. Yeah, you know, it's it's I think, yeah, and that's one of the things that that I don't want to let get lost in this discussion about Dallas losing a regular season game to the best team in the NHL right now, which is that this team is still very I mean, I, I would like honestly, I would say that Dallas is absolutely the favorite. And that's even with the moves that Vegas made. Um, you look at like broadly speaking, like if we just forget about Jake Ottinger and just assume that, like, well, he bounces back because well, he's been good longer than he's been bad, right? Um, then a lot of the other team, you know, it's not like it's easy for us who watch Dallas, the Dallas Stars from shift to shift to kind of, you know, nitpick and criticize the things that we think um, will lead to Dallas's defeat. But listen, Colorado still has depth issues. Um, and if you're someone that believes in, in size on the blue line, well, you could argue that, well, you know, them adding Sean Walker is not going to be the ad they think of it. They think it is when it gets down to the marrow. Uh, Vegas, Vegas, if you look at Vegas' stats, 
they're like 12th and 14th and like goals for goals against their special teams are mediocre. Um, this is a team that really needed to make, you know, as, as much credit as we give them for the moves they made, they needed to make them, you know, they're in a second, they're in the second wild card spot. Um, this is a team that has struggled and granted injuries have been like a big you know, reason for that. But I would still say that Dallas and to me, Vancouver, pure paper tiger, that team is hot air. Dallas to me is still the toughest nut to crack. If you're a team facing them in the playoffs, you know, again, Andre, if you just take for granted that Andre will bounce, he did, Andre doesn't even need to be great. He just needs to be better. So if you take that for granted, top four, an elite top four blue line, and as much as I kind of nitpick, and I really don't like the top four as constructed, but more like in terms of stylistic and philosophical reasons, not so much because I think the players are in any way bad. They're all fantastic. And just the depth that they have, like I, I still – I don't know why you would want to face the Dallas Stars if you're in the West, um, because just broadly speaking, I, I think they're one of the most complete teams. Now, the reason why I think people overreact to this particular loss is because, well, if there is a recipe to beat them, tonight was kind of it. You know, the sort of the way that the third pair was exploited, and of course, Jake Ottinger, who we you know, take for granted may rebound, but there's no guarantee. And certainly like his uh, resume this season doesn't, you know, allude to that. The people that feel as though Wedgwood should get more games. What do you say? (laughs) No, no. I mean, the thing is like, it's easy. It's, you know, this is kind of the perfect example of outcome bias, right? Wedgwood losses, which is true. Right. Wedgwood has, you know, been in more wins, but you look at the save percentage. I mean, Wedgwood has not been the cause of those wins. He's just happened to be the goaltender in games that Dallas won. Um, and and also, you know, like Wedgwood is he's good because our expectations are low for him, um, which is not really like an insult. He's a backup, you know, backups you want to be players that simply don't lose you the game. And that's a guy that doesn't lose you the game. And credit to him. Andre is yeah. a guy that can actively steal you games, which he's capable of. Now, we've seen it every now and then this year, obviously less than we'd like, but um, but that's the ability that Andre has that Wedgwood doesn't. I guarantee, you know, this, I, I don't think Wedgwood is going to be like Hudobin 2.0. Um, now, did, that doesn't mean I wouldn't want to see maybe Wedgwood get a start in the playoffs, especially if Dallas, say, like, he loses a couple in a row. I think you'd probably want to consider it, but no, like it's, that's not, that's not even a discussion. And of course, Ottinger is part of your long-term plan. You want to show allegiance to him. You want to establish good relationships. Well, you're going to give him as much rope as possible. A couple of notes for stars fans for tomorrow. Yes. Colorado took care of business tonight in Calgary, but now they now face a back-to-back in Vancouver tomorrow night. That has a couple of interesting little tidbits, David. Hard to believe if the Stars won tonight, they would have been tied for the Western Conference. That's how hot they've been. And we need to put that in perspective. Um, so that's fascinating. And by the way, whoever wins the Western Conference likely gets Vegas in the first round. That is uh, a little tough. But Winnipeg also in action. The Predators at the Jets. Preds, red hot right now. So, Stars could be idle and actually gain some traction tomorrow night with a Vancouver win and a Predators win in Winnipeg. So, that'll be interesting uh, to watch. And then the Stars go at it again on Thursday and on Saturday. So, kind of, you know, an exciting night of watching NHL hockey. Uh, But... You know, I'll have my eye on that Vancouver Colorado matchup. That'll be really interesting tomorrow night. Yeah, I it's you know, I, I just like I just completely clowned on Vancouver because I really don't believe I, I think there are always teams that just get the right breaks in the regular season. And I think Vancouver is a good example of that. But that doesn't mean like you don't take them seriously. You absolutely take them seriously. And there are certainly and there are also certain things they're doing that are trending up. Of course. Uh, the Elias Lindholm trade, uh, which I think was awful, is still nonetheless, um, it, this, we're still talking about a player that is absolutely going to help them win games. Um, and so, but I, what I think is interesting is that if you look at the first round percentage odds, Dallas is 33% to play Colorado in the first round, 20% 
and this is a new wrinkle, right? It used to be Colorado and Winnipeg, 20% to play Nashville. Yeah. And then 19% to play Winnipeg, um, which is, I think if you're, if you're Dallas and I would suspect that Vegas ends up, Vegas is going to win more games down the stretch. And I would not expect them to be in the second car, second spot wild card um, when all is said and done. Uh, so which which makes things interesting because I think if Dallas if Dallas manages to get a first round matchup with Nashville, that that's going to fuel the argument that that they can win the cup um, because that's just the perfect first round matchup, kind of like with Minnesota last year, where yeah they'll be competitive and they'll be the plucky underdog, but they're going to lose in the end. They're, they're just not good enough. Um, and, and yes, Nashville has played Dallas tough. I don't want to in any way underestimate them. Um, or what Brunette has done with the Predators. Yeah. Uh, but um, but at the same time, like that's going to be, you need, I think for teams to win the cup, sometimes it's also about, you know, it's it's not so much uh, sort of a test between, um, you know, who's truly the best, but also who can truly endure. Like the playoffs are just that difficult. And so yep. you need that soft touch every now and then, whether it's in the, you know, opening round or the second round or whatever. And, and that's going to be, I think necessary for Dallas to truly win. Cause yeah. I, I, it's hard for me to see them winning it all. If say they're going through like Vegas and Colorado in the first two rounds. Right. Right. And you have to play who's in front of you, but you know, I, I, I talk to myself when I'm going over this stuff sometimes because I'm like, you know, I don't like Nashville as a matchup and <laughs> So I just really? think Nashville's played them really tough. I think Nashville, you know, has some physical players that I think give some stars some issues. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, okay, well, you don't like playing Colorado either, and you don't want to play Vegas. So, Gavin, who do you want to play? And the bottom line is, is that the eight teams that are in, anyone can beat anyone. It's very rare that it's, you know, I mean, sure, you'll have favorites and everything, but that's hockey. And parity in hockey is probably stronger than it ever has been. Um, Especially you know, in the Pacific. Yes, yes, absolutely. Where you where you look and, um, you know, Edmonton now is the second spot and the L.A. Clink Kings have climbed up. They were the wild card for a while and, you know, they've taken over for uh, Vegas. And so, you know, it's interesting because Vegas is three, six and one in their last 10, whereas LA has a winning record of five, four and one. So, you know, those are difference makers. So you have to play who's in front of you and the stars can be any of the eight. Um, but there are teams that I think can give them some issues. So, um, that doesn't, you know, sometimes when we talk about this stuff objectively, you know, I don't want people to think that we're haters. We're just not, you know, I mean, I, I think, David, we can agree that we all want the stars to do well. But the purpose of this podcast is also to have objective opinions and express when there are matchups that can be concerning and why. I apologize for being such like a goober because I'm still like laughing in the background and having to mute myself <laughs> over over the L.A. Clings. And, oh, did I say uh, Clings? You said Clings. Yeah, it was yeah you know, it's been the, uh, yeah, yeah. John Klingberg and the L.A. Clings. Yeah, um, doesn't play for them, but that would make sense. Um, long day. Um, as you were talking tonight, I was saying, why am I so calm after this loss? And uh, I think it's because of you and your voice. And um, so kudos <laughs> to you, man. <laughs> Maybe I've just had one of those days where I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to talk about the game tonight and hopefully people listen and hopefully this is a good breakdown and people can look at it objectively and say, yes, absolutely. It was a brutal loss. But at the same time, why are you mad? Your team is in first place. You're up by uh, two points against Colorado, two points against Winnipeg. You know, you're in the playoffs. You're six, three and one in their last 10. So, I mean, you know, you're playing good hockey and, and the best part is, is you're better on the road than you are at home. And you have a Stankoven, which yes. this has been like a thing at the Substack. I don't like stanky and like stank the tank. I just, this is just my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I like endless Ford. I like oven master. I like, there are a lot of things that I like more than those nicknames, but I mean, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> Still, you know, I think that I think that I'm really curious, actually, what 
your stars fan base is like, right? Because there's usually not to stereotype, but I do think there are absolutely like different types of stars fans. Like if you go to Reddit, you're going to find your sort of positive, nothing can hurt us crowd. Like we're going to win the cup every year. Uh, you go to the HF boards, you're going to find the most cynical people on the planet. Um, if you go to the star stack, I'm not actually sure. I, I think the people at my star stack are pretty, uh, pretty discerning, but, um, uh, but I'm really curious what your stars fans are like that they think you have to, <laughs> you know, you have to preface, right. Your criticism with, Hey, we're just being objective. Calm down. We're, we're not hating <laughs> that. Yeah. Is it oh, okay? They're, they're the super positive types that kind of. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews or news, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call them on your auto insurance too with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Yo, Trey. Kevin, what's up, man? You know, I've been thinking, what would have happened if the NBA never vetoes the Chris Paul trade to the Lakers and we get CP3 in the same backcourt as Kobe in L.A.? Well, you get a very happy Jack Nicholson, for sure. And the Lakers probably win a bunch more championships. CP3 finally gets a ring or two or three. And the Kardashian empire is forever altered. That's what what did you just say? Fly, sack, hey, everybody, I'm Trey Wingo. And I'm Kevin Frazier, and we're teaming up on a new weekly sports podcast from Wondery Alternate Routes. As former sports center anchors and current sports obsessives, we're consumed by all the what-if questions that make being a sports fan so excruciatingly fun. If you're like us, then you also live and die on the fallout from every drop pass. Or play call. Each week on Alternate Routes, we'll take a flashpoint in sports, break down what actually happened, then explore every alternate scenario and the ripple effects it would have caused. Follow Alternate Routes on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen early and ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus. Uh, no, 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 no. I think, I think they're, you know, it's one of those things where um, sometimes you express your opinion and they, you know, they say you're wrong. And I'm like, I can't, you know, I can't have arguments like, you know, I'm expressing my opinion. That doesn't mean if you want to disagree with it, that's fine. But, you know, it's, it's okay. <laughs> I, mean, I, probably, yeah, I feel like I put you in a tough spot where it's like, well, Gavin, how much do you hate your own listeners? <laughs> it's not- no, I absolutely love my own listeners. And my, you know, for the most part, they're extremely supportive and I appreciate everything, um, you know, that they say it's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, that my job I feel is just to talk about the game, to hopefully educate them in some aspects. And then, what I really try to do is bring on people like you, Robert, Craig, Sean, um, others, uh, you know, Steven down at Texas to give different perspectives so that, you know, those are what we would classify as insiders. And whether it's your analytics or what you see, it's different eyeballs and we can disagree on stuff, but it's various eyeballs looking at the same team. So I, that that's what I like about spits and suds. And for the most part, that's the feedback that we're getting. Um, and it's really cool, like on the Apple portion where people can always leave comments um, and rate spits and suds. That is one of the biggest things that they talk about is the various people that we have on with their insight. And your lovely voice. I, I think that's that's another thing. that No, nah, man. I've seen those comments at least. <laughs> the, you know, like... <laughs> And your laugh too. You have a great laugh, by the way. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, the reality is, is I can't wait for the playoffs to come. It's been a long season, and I'm excited to talk to you and so many others in the playoffs, and and you know, get this rolling, and let's see what this thing's all about. And this is this is exciting, and um, I think we'll all wake up tomorrow and look forward to New Jersey, and then look forward to the LA Kings, and look forward to you know number nine forever. You know, being a and we still don't know what the statue is going to be. Um, By the way, before we get to the statue, yeah, like let's just let's backtrack a little bit because I think sort of if, if there's a reason why maybe we sort of are there, there's a little extra criticism. 
um, in especially in a game like this, it's because the standard is so high because the stars have set that standard so high, and that's a good thing, right? That's yeah. a good thing that start like we're criticizing like little things that may be inconsequential in the long run because they're just so damn good. And, and an example of that I think was, you know, one of the things that, that I've talked about personally and that I've written about is just the top line underperforming. And my personal opinion is that well, Pavelski's finally hitting a wall, yada, yada. But Robertson and Hintz were fantastic tonight. Yes. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't get to see them a whole lot with the third period with all the penalties, but those are two players that were just made me think, whoa, the top line is back. And uh, I didn't see a whole lot. And, whole lot of like talk about that on Twitter because of course the you know Dallas was too busy imploding but but still like I mean that's the kind of like that Robertson and Hintz you know sort of regaining their top line form is the kind of thing that's sustainable. Marchment and like you know Tanev you know taking some penalties in the last 10 minutes of the game that's not sustainable. Um well may, maybe Marchment taking penalties in the third period is sustainable but I mean for the most part like those are not scenarios we're gonna see kind of replicated long term whereas Robertson and Hintz I thought I, it was crazy because Florida is a fast team and they had trouble with Hintz's speed all night and yeah Hintz is fast but you're rarely going to see him just kind of barrel through an elite team like that shift to shift yeah no you're absolutely right how does five foot eight Logan Stankoven <laughs> Just absolutely press Nico Mikola up against the boards, who stands at six point five. Did you see that little thing? I mean, oh yeah, absolutely. It's... It was a it was a check of beauty, and it was it was a check that made a difference. And that's what I love about the kid is that you know the wheels are, you know, continue going. And you were just mentioning nicknames. This is a reach. What about Wolverine? You know, I, I prefer somebody mentioned Weapon X, which I think is cooler than okay. Wolverine. But but you know, listen, like I I think that's that's fine. I, it, and I'm you know so why I'm doing it's... that, right? No, why? Okay, I call him Wolverine because the last movie in the Wolverine series was Logan. <laughs> I don't, you know, like I, I don't, really? you know, really? I, I I am I'm, I'm semi judging right here. <laughs> I'm semi judging you. I feel hockey, you know what? Hockey, listen, hockey, stick to hockey. Nicknames and creativity, you know, leave on the side. But but I I don't have a problem with any of those nicknames. I I personally, I think, which is somebody, something I heard on Twitter actually. I I thought Oven Master is still fantastic. But um, but again, people may feel like that's not creative at all. And I'm like, okay, well, then I just don't know. The point is, Logan Stankoven is fantastic. And um, it, it, by the way, that's like I, you know, that was something you saw in the AHL. I, I think it's funny that people still talk about the AHL like this kind of, like sort of borderline CHL league. Yeah. And no, there are like a ton of like veterans that are still, you know, awesome. former NHL veterans that play. You, it's it's a much better league than it used to be. And Stankoven was doing this to you know guys like Elmer Soderblom in in the uh, in the AHL. So. Um, there's right like you know height and, and and size are not necessarily the same thing and and i mean he just uses that center of gravity to great effect and and is an example of a player that really he's kind of like the inverse of robertson robertson who plays small versus stankoven really plays a big man's game and um and it's it's just just a pleasure to watch like one of the my absolute favorite players to watch just in general and i watch plenty of other hockey um, and so Stankoven really even there stands <laughs> stands above, shall we say, for lack of better phrasing. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned that because I've oh man, it has to Barry be. Sanders. By the way, that's who he reminds me of Barry Sanders. Okay, all right, yeah. Speed and toughness, right? Yeah, I don't yeah, think you're going to find a better combo in football. I've talked to at least ten people, and I want to say four or five of which are were were or are AHL players. And the word that I threw out there best describe AHL to NHL was consistency, not physicality, not size, but consistency. And they said, yep, you nailed it. That's that's the difference. The people that end up in the NHL are far more consistent. And I thought that was a good apt description of the difference between the AHL 
in the NHL. It's a, it, the development league. It is so impressive how good the AHL is now, like to the, you know, to the point where you really have to focus on the differences because they're so slight. And by the way, that's just not to sort of bring us back to uh, sort of rants about development, but that's why I also tend to be bullish about prospects that succeed in the AHL because I feel like sort of the difference between these leagues is just is is really kind of narrowed. Um, and so, um, I mean, be, beyond that, like I, I think for you know whatever we might think about sort of this game. Um, you know, this game is not going to be what defines the star season. It's going to be the playoffs. And I think that's what makes games like this frustrating more than anything for me, which is that like, I'm sick of the regular season. Like, let's just go, let's get this thing started. Let's start the playoffs because just like in Toronto, right? That's ultimately the measure of this team's value, which is, can they get it done in crunch time? Can Audra find that not even next level, but you know, the previous level, right? That he's been capable of. And, and I think that more than anything is frustrating for fans because they're like, okay, we know they're good enough. We know they're even great, but is it enough to win a cup? And that's the question. Cause there are a lot of great teams. And that was another thing that, you know, kind of maybe like a uh, world that I personally like you know, kind of didn't address as much, which is that like you were talking about a season that has achieved a level of parity that is never seen before and it just so happens that most of that power is seated in the West. And that's the difficult part for Stars fans, which is that, well, you have like six or eight teams that could conceivably win the cup in the West. I mean, call me crazy, but I wouldn't be surprised if LA won the cup. Like, I, I they're, they're like just a really fantastic team, hit a tough stretch, um, and – I, I think they're the goods, but again, it's a perfect example. Like they don't have like a ton of points because the Pacific just has so many other absolute killers. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely agree. My friend, this has always been fun. You are the man. Thank you for the recap. Um, just going to throw it out there. Three stars of the game. Barkov who scored two goals, not one of them. Um, <laughs> I, I don't understand the three stars sometimes, but I guess it's just a. Maybe they're using I, fancy stats now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I it's just a it's just a lost art, you know. Three stars according to NHL.com. Matthew Kachuk is the number one star with two assists. Bobrovsky number two, and Jason Robertson number three. So. Just, I thought you said Jake Ottinger for a second. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, no, 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 no. And, you know, we should point out, listen, we talk about, you know, parts of the game, and David pointed this out, penalty kill. Three of four for Florida, 75%. That, you know, you have one of the best kill units in the league, just didn't get the job done tonight. Whether you want to blame Ottinger, whether you want to blame Hockenpah, that's a massive point of the game. Also point out third period face-offs. They didn't win as many as they usually do. They're usually better in the dot, especially late in the game, winning face-offs. So there were just a lot of determining factors and, uh, you know, something to improve on. But, David, you are an absolute beast. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, they love listening to you on Spits and Suds and can't wait to do it uh, once again. If they want to reach you on Twitter, at David Castillo. And support him on Substack, where he's always doing some really, really cool articles, writing, analytic, at Starstack. Thank you, my man. Thank you. That was, that was an absolute pleasure, as always. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, one and all, for listening to Spits and Suds. We truly appreciate it. You know, it's games like this after the game where we try to break it down for you and just kind of take like an overall look. And hopefully you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, feel free to give us a good rating uh, online, which is always appreciated. Leave a comment on how good David's voice is. That's always appreciated. My voice, not so much. Uh, but at the same time, thank you one and all. We got some cool programs coming up this week. Of course, we'll have our post games as well. We'll have our regular NHL insider, Sean Shapiro, talking about this stuff. We didn't even get to Atlanta, supposedly. You know, the first offering as far as a franchise coming to Atlanta. Come on. But that's another podcast for another time. And that's the thing about Spits and Suds. We always have other things to get to. So until next time, I'm Gavin Spittle of 105.3 The Fan. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day.